Yeah, we can see that now. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you very much for this opportunity to, to talk. And, and it's wonderful getting a chance to uh, follow Steve Piper. Continue with some of the same theme that he just presented, but really I'm um, taking maybe even a further step back and talking about the tools, technique, and motivation for developing the communities behind ITK slash Ceremona. And, and really this motivation, uh, the work that is embodied by these three toolkits and other um, open source projects is really this concept of open science um, that I first learned about from Terry Yu at the National Library of Medicine um, during the development of ITK. And open science is, is really based on the idea that for science to be science, for science to be effective, it has to be reproducible. And for us, this means writing open source code, making that code freely available. So that's one component of it. But it's also sharing the data and sharing the publications, detailed publications, so that given the code, the data in these publications, your work can be fully reproduced. And we think of this very much in the sense of open science. But one of the things I want to keep in mind is if your work can really be reproduced, this also works. This is a great technique to follow. It's a great philosophy to have, even if you're working within a company and you want your software and your development to be uh, reused and sustained within the company or within a research lab where you have students graduating all the time, as long as you could reproduce your students' work, there's value there. That's continual improvement that can happen. And so this open source, open science really has a lot of potential beyond just these toolkits. But looking at these uh, toolkits and looking at the history of this, um, it really has, um, well before the toolkits ever began, the history comes from Descartes, who in 1637 published his, his discourse on the scientific method. And in this, he said, doubt everything and only believe in those things that are evidently true. Only believe in those things that are reproducible. And so this is where the, the concept that for science to be science, it has to be reproducible. And you'll see that in ITK, you'll see that in Slicer and in Monai. And in ITK, this is really when open science became mainstream for medical imaging. And for 3D Slicer, it built upon that in order to then allow that open science to have clinical translation, clinical impact. And now Monai is combining all the lessons learned from ITK, Slicer, and other projects and really to represent some of the best of open science and, and what comes next. So Insight Toolkit. Um, it's open source that began in 1999, all right, so last century. And you have to realize that back in 1999, open source, let alone open source for scientific studies, <coughs> was an option, right? Everyone back then really thought that they could do it better on their own. And so um, every lab had their own um, set of software. Um, some matrices were column major order, others were row major order. There was no compatibility between them. It was really difficult um, in order for science to really be advanced or for code to be shared because it was so incompatible. NIH recognized this as a problem, and in particular, National Library of Medicine, um, they had the visible human data had just come out. And so they had some data out there, but no one could process it in a consistent manner. And so they funded a $13.5 million effort um, to six different teams from 1999 to 2005 to develop the Insight Toolkit. So when you think you can do something better on your own, whether it's back in 1999 or today, realize $13.5 million went into this. And now fast forward to 2023, we have over 41,000 commits from 302 contributors worldwide for 1.2 million lines of code. And looking at the commits per month, it's still increasing. Um, it's been increasing um, fairly consistently since its original development. Um, it's C++ and Python code. It supports DICOM and 40 other image formats. It's best in class image segmentation and registration methods. Um, over 70% of ITK has actually been written by people outside of the original development team. It's really come in from the best and the best, the best and the brightest that are out there. It features GPU acceleration, cloud and distributed processing, microscopy and pathology support. And because of its flexibility and this foundation and this rich history, it's now out there in, in a variety of different commercial applications, as well as um, open source projects such as 3D Slicer and whatnot. And really, again, in 1999, it was mainstream for doing, uh, it was unique for doing open source. 
And then fast forward to 2006, this is the trick that ITK used to develop, to uh, grow its community and grow its software in a sustainable kind of way. It developed what was called the Insight Journal. And the Insight Journal um, practiced open science. It required you to create a PDF, a description of your algorithm, um, as well as the code for the algorithm itself, and then the data that's used to generate the images shown in the PDF. All of that had to be contributed, bundled together, and then submitted as a publication, submitted as an article, um, as an open science article within the Insight Journal. Um, fast forward, we now have over 1,900 publications that have had over 360,000 downloads. Um, they have DOIs, or, or handles for doing citations, with some papers having thousands of citations. And a lot of these uh, publications, a lot of these bundles of code, data, and publications now are part of the continuous testing process of ITK. And this is a method whereby the most popular um, methods out there by citations, by people voting and so forth, they now end up being part of the core part of ITK. And so this was a way of um, essentially serving as a gatekeeper or allowing the community to vote for what they wanted to become part of the core of ITK. And now much like Slicer, um, what we've adopted is this, uh, this extensions or modules that can be added on to ITK. So even if you don't come up, become part of core, it's very easy for you to contribute to ITK as an external module that's easily added on. And as Steve talked about, um, it used the Apache 2.0 license for the vast majority of these publications in ITK core that facilitated its commercial use. And these commercial groups, one of the things I want to point out that Stephen didn't point out, uh, that didn't mention, but is really critical, is these commercial companies, they are phenomenal at doing regular evaluation and bug fixing on these toolkits. So if someone creates a module and this module gets evaluated and um, this module is used and um, all of a sudden, something changes in ITK core and this module no longer works, but a company, a commercial company depended on it. Well, they're going to fix that bug so that when you then go to use that module for your own project, you know it's going to work. And so these commercial companies really improve the quality of the codes. And so their, their work is invaluable. And so that allowed ITK to grow and be stable by adopting these open science practices of reproducibility um, for testing and, and growth. And that led to its adoption by 3D Slicer and other toolkits. All right, so 3D Slicer, we just saw a full presentation on that. It's a graphical user interface to ITK and other toolkits that are out there. Wonderful visualization capabilities for a variety of different applications, including image guided and uh, image guided procedures. Uh, it's been customized into regulatory approved commercial applications because of its Apache or its variant on the Apache and BSD licenses. And really, what we're seeing now, what Steve pointed out, and that I'll talk a little bit more about, is it's become this wonderful vehicle for the development and delivery of AI because of the annotation capabilities, the access to data, and so forth that um, Slicer provides. All right, so third and final topic then is that AI. So why is AI succeeding? All right, I'm going to argue that it's succeeding for two different reasons. One is the performance, and that's obvious, right? Um, IT, um, Monai, our AI within the medical field with the segment anything models and so forth, it's just phenomenal. Chat G, GTP and so forth, what it's doing is just absolutely phenomenal. But I'm going to argue that the other reason why AI is succeeding and why we're seeing this rapid continuous advancement is because AI has fully embraced open science in the past decade. All right, so again, for relative to this group, why is deep learning, why is AI succeeding? Well, um, it's because of performance. And here's an example that I'm going to talk about a little bit later on. This is um, um, Monai running, where on the left is the video input of simulated data um, from the DaVinci system, um, DVRK system. And um, on the right, what we're showing is segmentation of the instruments of the grippers, of the thread, and of the needle, all being done in real time by the Monai system. And so this is just one example. To do this in a conventional system would be really difficult. 
um, we have a Monai tutorial that actually allows you to develop and replicate this work through a Python notebook with not a lot of effort. It's just phenomenal what AI can accomplish with a little bit of work. And again, there's this tutorial that's out there because there's wonderful data out there, both simulated and real data that you can build upon and great publications. Where are these publications coming from? Uh, in the tutorials, we're constantly citing Argive. Argive is the repo where if you do anything interesting in deep learning, you put it in the Argive before it shows up even at CDPR. It is the open access publication portal, but then a lot of journals are now open access as well. And then we have open access data. ImageNet was really the, the catalyst for deep learning. Um, becoming popular, it's like a natural image database. But TCIA, uh, the Cancer Imaging Archive and the Associated Imaging Data Commons from the NIH, as well as standard data formats and so forth, are huge collections of medical images that we can use and build upon that are now freely available and out there. Getting access to images is becoming less and less of a problem compared to years ago. And a lot of those images are using a Creative Commons by attribution license, which I strongly recommend, um, that allows for the commercial use of that data. Occasionally, you'll run across the, the uh, Creative Commons no commercial use because someone thinks they're going to be able to make some money off their data. But the chances of making money off your data is slim to nil. And so I really recommend that we CC by attribution. If you've heard of someone who's made a lot of money off of selling data on the web, let me know. I haven't heard that story yet. Anyway, moving on, um, then we have open access software, um, the third component, the third leg in that stool, and that's uh, giving us uh, PyTorch and things like Monai and the Apache license it uses. And so Monai is the medical open network for AI that I hope you all have already heard about. Um, it began as a work between King's College London, right there in your backyard, as well as NVIDIA, commercial group right from the start was involved freely available, community supported, didn't come up with new standards, but built upon PyTorch as its base, as its foundation, and involved people from the German Cancer Research Center, from KCL, um, from Kitware, from a variety of different groups to all contribute to this common platform, where they're creating a platform and competing with these other groups. It was a very inclusive development that went on, and it pr prioritizes reproducibility. And the way it does that for AI is a whole other presentation in and of itself that I don't have time for today. So, um, but it prioritizes it. Now, Monai, what is it capable of? Well, it's really impacting the entire imaging workflow. And this begins with image reconstruction, reconstructing of CT and now <coughs> data. Um, and it moves on to include image segmentation with the latest transformer networks, autoseg, 3D, um, and then UNet and so forth includes registration and longitudinal study methods and multi-channel data and it goes all the way on to survival prediction so it's not just the image processing segmentation and registration but outcome survival prediction and all of those things are capable with mona we're now at um so it began in 2019 is when the idea came around um, we just did the 1.0 release in September of 2022, and we hit 1.1 million downloads already. The acceptance of this and the distribution of it around the world is absolutely phenomenal. Our first workshop that we held had people from 54 different countries with over 700 participants, and this was a freely available online workshop a year or two years ago. We have 150 plus contributors, 3,400 stars and so forth. It's really absolutely taking off uh, in this very short amount of time with the 1.0 release just out. And in that 1.0 release, we have support for radiological images, pathology images, and endoscopy and other video formats. Um, and then the components of Monai are shown here on the left-hand side. And then the main components are Monai label, this is AI assisted annotation. This is something that this is um, methods, Python based methods that you can run within Slicer, for example, in order to have the AI pick a data set from your collection of data that an expert needs to annotate. 
suggests an initial segmentation of that data, an initial annotation of that data um, for the expert. The expert then edits it and sends that back to the AI. The AI improves its ability to do the segmentation. It learns from the annotation that expert that just did and then picks another data set intelligently from its collection saying, all right, given my current performance, here's the next data set that I want this expert to annotate in order to so that my learning can progress the fastest. We're hoping to reduce annotation time and numbers by 75% with this AI assisted annotation system that we have. And then this all runs on top of Monai Core, which has um, a variety of federated learning and other AI techniques within it. And then once you've got your system trained up, once you've annotated your system and you've got your um, high performing AI, we have Monai Deploy, which allows you to bet, embed it within essentially a PAC system or as a DICOM service that you can push your DICOM images to, and the AI run against it, and then the AI can push the results back as um, PDFs or as um, DICOM say, DICOM RT struct objects um, to your PAC system. And so it's a really powerful end-to-end -end workflow that you have from annotation to research and algorithms to deploying. And just as there was extensions within Slicer and the journal articles within ITK inside journal, we have our dissemination system, which is the Monai Model Zoo. And this Model Zoo has all these pre-trained networks. And with the release of 1.3, which will be coming out right before Nekai, we're emphasizing the Monai bundle, um, which is your um, pre-trained model, making it really easy to contribute it to this Monai Zoo and to use a model from a Monai Zoo to run inference on your data or as a foundation or as a backbone network that you then specialize for a particular task. And so again, open science is being um, applied here. And so last, last bit to talk about then that we're doing um, is then we're interfacing these systems with specialized <coughs> And the HoloScan SDK that provides an interface with that hardware, it runs just on any old CPU or else it can run accelerated on an NVIDIA GPU. It specializes in having low latency as it interfaces with ROS, ROS2, DVRK for DaVinci, frame grabbers, simulated data, AR, VR glasses, so forth and so on. It's a freely available Apache uh, licensed software is the whole scan SDK that is really this powerful interface to all of these devices. And so it's kind of like the next step, once you've got free data, um, free um, algorithms and the publication describing it, now you also have this interface with hardware that allows it great portability across systems. And so we have a panel discussion coming up and, and with the theme of the uh, workshop today, open source for surgical planning, I want to put out a teaser, all right? And this is what is needed for AI or, and for open source and open science to really continue on this trajectory. We saw the new SNAP system that Slicer is developing and there's a variety of other things out there. But if you want to get regulatory approval for something right now, whether it's your CE mark or your FDA, that's really something that is not based on um, evaluating the accuracy of software as much as it's based on, did you test your software the way you said you were going to test it, all right? And so it, it's a subtlety, but it's really, it's not about the safety of the software per se or specifically, all right? The FDA doesn't come up with the tests, you specify what those tests are. And really the FDA and, and this whole process is all about making it so that you can commercially sell your system, make a profit on it and minimize your liability. All right, but open source that doesn't apply. What we really need for open source to advance is a way for a regulatory system to confirm the safety of the software directly, um, where that software is community supported, open source and freely available. Can we come up with a, a transparent process that is well documented using a set of perhaps pre-collected data or predefined tools, have a continuous testing process that runs as that software is being developed that confirms its safety in this regulatory process. And that way our software can really have worldwide use and completely disrupt the medical surgical field by having this freely available software that uh, can be used clinically. 
All right. Thank you all very much for your time. Food for thought. <laughs> yeah, so I'm Kevin, Children's Hospital, Washington, D.C. So, Stephen, um, the great uh, idea about the FDA regulations there, and uh, actually at uh, the workshop on Thursday with Andreas Melzer, I'll be talking about the FDA ID process, you know, and regulatory issues. And I think the, uh, the idea is great, but the FDA wants to see the effect of the software on your system. So if I use open source software with a medical robot, even if the software is validated, unless I can validate to FDA that it's safe to use when it drives my device, um, you know, I don't think just showing the software is safe alone it is enough. So what, uh, what are your comments on that idea? Uh, I skipped over the last, last bullet item on this slide because I was yeah. kind of going over time here a little bit. Um, HelloScan, for example. So there's the HelloScan SDK, which is open source freely available interfacing with this hardware. You can run that on HelloScan approved hardware that NVIDIA happens to sell, um, but it has already gone through the UL, um, author, um, um, UL evaluation underwriter laboratory. Has this very costly evaluation for any hardware you wanna bring into a surgical suite, right? It's already UL approved. It's already approved for running AI models um, in this very controlled system. It's not cheap hardware, <laughs> but it does get towards uh, addressing what you're talking about. They give you the documentation, everything that you need in order to speed FDA or regulatory approval. If you're running your AI models that are Monai AI models and so forth and so on that you just load into their system and run on their hardware. And so we're making progress towards that. And I think that, that, that this is an important part. And actually this starts forming the fourth leg of the stool here that you do this interfacing with the software and the hardware together. I think we can achieve that regulatory approval. You're right. Hey, I agree with you though. Take it a step back, Kevin. There's a lot of questions to be asked here and uh, <laughs> it's not a short putt, but I think, I think it's not an insurmountable we're making progress. I believe there's just, an image. Yeah. yeah, hey, Stephen, it's me, Steve. I, um, just to add to that, and, and I don't want us to all sound like we're NVIDIA salespeople here because yeah. that would work. <laughs> yeah, but they do happen to do a lot of uh, cool things, obviously. Yeah. One other thing that they have is, and they push a lot, is this concept of the virtual twin, and they have this Omniverse platform that includes physical simulation and AI and rendering. <laughs> and in some sense, I think, you know, that's, that almost embodies the, the concept that FDA is looking for. Like here's, here's a way to simulate adverse events. What will you do in the case of some unexpected hardware failure? So, you know, it'll never be perfect, of course, but, but uh, that kind of would be the way I would think about trying to look at the system level issues. Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree when you're developing medical devices, anything you can do to ease the regulatory burden because FDA keeps on putting, I've been through two ID processes and hopefully the third time I'll get it. But they keep acting like I'm gonna sell this system. But this is just first in human trial for an MR robot now. One issue is it's pediatrics, it's in kids, which makes it worse. But regulatory burden is still very high for uh, you know, people trying to get uh, devices out and for first in human use. I was just in a meeting with the FDA that DARPA actually hosted and um, DARPA was asking the FDA representative, um, what has changed because of AI? And yeah. they said, the main thing that has changed because of AI is if you do, uh, if you gather your data, if you do your study at just one or two institutes, we're not going to authorize you. You have to involve yeah. multiple institutes in order to make certain bias has crept in and so forth and so on. And so And so, yeah, Kevin, I imagine you're hitting some roadblocks if you're using AI within your system. Yeah. We live in Washington, D.C. We should be able to do those things, I would think. Just joking. <laughs> <laughs> Any other question? Yeah. 
Okay, so we have one question. Um, so for the long-term support of the libraries, um, so thinking about <coughs> adopting new hardware, for example, FPGA hardware, uh, I know there's coming some new kits from NVIDIA. How you so plan all these like short and long-term goals for, for developing software? Is it based on like, um, like uh, like they will delivering a new uh, like package version of the library, delivering like a new paper, a new model. How you plan these short and long uh, long term goals for for software development? Yeah. Well, and first off, by the way, you know, I just want to know if you all know I'm I'm purely a volunteer on one eye. Nvidia doesn't pay me a dime. All right, I'm just a big fan as well, just like Steve. And so, uh, anyway, um, it, it, there it is a whole process of transparency and communication um, that um, you have to have um, a couple of key people. You need to have your Steve Piper and your uh, JCs and, and so forth at uh, Jay Christophs that are um, kind of at the helm. Um, but they switch from being um, people who do the development to people who help other people do the development, all right? Where um, they've really taken on a role where they help people, um, help the community thrive and move forward and create and contribute in a way that is sustainable and in a way that is um, aligned with the overall goals of the system. And so, I, you know, when it comes to both short-term and long-term contributions, you no longer look at like you don't take the attitude of well, I'm part of this core development team, so I have to do all the work and all the development. But you have to pivot to this um, having this core team be supporters of that community. And if you have that attitude, um, then your open source platform is going to absolutely thrive and grow faster than what you could ever do on your own. And I think that's what Steve was saying in response to Kevin's um uh, threat to terminate I'm just kidding um <laughs> you know Kevin, Kevin's comment about uh, you know what if Steve gets hit by one of those uh, two-story red buses right um <laughs> it's, 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 it's going to keep going um it, it's going to keep going and thriving because this community is there um it's just that you need someone to help that community along who's going to replace Steve it's not like that the code is going to bring. So does that answer your question? Uh, as kind yeah. of the sustainability is a pivot from thinking of something you're developing to thinking of supporting that community. And then about the same level of effort as, you know, exponential return. Yeah. Thank you very much, Stephen. And yeah, thank you uh, for our next speaker.